Hello, my name is Evan. I'm the Community Manager at Boston Virtual ARTCC, and I'm excited to be joined here by CFI Alec to talk through a really exciting ground school on holds. We recorded this session live a few days ago on August 24, and that recording is available on our YouTube channel as well. But we decided that since this is such an exciting topic and there's so much to go through, and it's also a really interactive session, we decided that we would do a special recording just for those of you watching along and wanting to follow along at home. So rather than having to hear all of our questions and to sit through while others were actually trying to figure out the entries, you'll be able to go through this seminar at your own pace, taking each of the examples and interactive questions as an opportunity to check your learning as you go. I'll just give a brief introduction today and say that this is one of the most complicated ground school seminars that we have. It's a series of highly nuanced topics, everything from wind corrections to how to enter a hold correctly. And it has implications not just for holding, but for instrument approach clearances and other procedures that you'll encounter when you're flying online and potentially when you're flying in the real world as well. Although, of course, that's not what this session is designed to cover. We're going to talk about a lot of different things today. As I said, we're going to cover speed restrictions. We're going to cover how to make wind corrections. We'll talk a lot about entries. And this can get confusing very quickly. But I want to say up front that if there's only two things you walk away from this session with, the most important things for us considering as virtual air traffic controllers, those considerations are altitude and staying on the protected side of the hold. So if you don't necessarily follow your speed restrictions, we probably don't care too much about that as virtual controllers. We're never going to separate you in a hold by speed anyway. If you don't make your wind corrections perfectly and your outbound leg is a little bit longer than it should be, well, we can live with that. That's not a huge issue for us either. The only really important things for us are that you maintain the altitude that we've given you so that you are protected from any other aircraft that may be above or below you, and that you stay on the side of the hold that you're cleared for, the protected side. We'll talk about those two things in a little bit more detail. But again, if all you walk away from this session is two points, whenever you're dealing with a hold, stay at the altitude we give you, stay on the correct side of the hold, the protected side, and you'll be in good shape. So with that introduction in mind, I'll hand things over to Alec to lead us off on today's Ground School for Holds. Hey everyone, uh, Evan, that was an amazing introduction. Really couldn't have said anything better myself. I wonder, this is a pretty nuanced topic, so it's okay to feel confused. We'll try to answer as much as we can, but please feel free to reach out to either of us or any qualified flight instructor with any questions. So what are we covering tonight? We're gonna to be covering holding procedures, how to construct holding patterns and how to fly the actual holds. We're gonna start off with visual holds under VFR, then we're gonna talk about IFR stuff mainly, holding pattern construction, outbound and inbound wind correction, and then holding pattern entries. And it doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually is pretty nuanced, so I encourage you to pay attention as we go through. VFR holds, this is pretty simple stuff. When you're VFR, holding can be as simple as flying over a reference on the ground visually in a circle. Happen because of traffic conditions, inability to enter airspace or weather, um, for example, Oshkosh, um, tra busy traffic, they'll have everybody hold until they can get more airplanes in. You either pick a point or you're assigned a point by air traffic control and making a circle, oval, racetrack, whatever you want to call it, pattern over it, making sure the point is always in sight. Really no trick to this one. That was it. Now let's get into the tricky stuff, the IFR holds. These are assigned like any other instruction by air traffic control. They could be assigned or requested for any number of reasons, traffic density, weather, uncontrolled airports, equipment troubleshooting, course reversal. The first four we'll cover today, course reversal, I encourage you to check out our RNAV and approach plate ground seminar coming up in a few uh, short weeks. What is a holding pattern? An instrument hold is used to keep an aircraft within a limited amount of airspace until another clearance can be issued. It's kind of an air, it's, it's an airplane's equivalent of pulling over to the side of the road while you figure something out. So how do you define a holding pattern? Number one, a nav aid. Number two, an inbound leg. And number three, an outbound leg. And we're gonna talk through each of those. Let's talk about the nav aid. This is the center, uh, I don't wanna say center, this is the reference point of the hold. Um, all the holding instructions go about this point. A nav aid can be a VOR, uh, an NDB, like a non-directional beacon, intersection on GPS, a DME fix, an RNAV waypoint, uh, intersection of two radials, whatever you want it to be, or whatever air traffic control tells it to be. The inbound leg. This is key. 
the inbound leg, you always fly to the fix on the inbound leg. And that's always the leg that has the navigational guidance. So on the inbound leg, you're actually tracking a navigational guidance. On the outbound leg, you're using dead reckoning. And we'll talk about that in a second. To reiterate, you're always flying to the fix on the inbound leg with navigational guidance. As Alex says, this is a really important point, and it's a point of confusion for a lot of people that we've seen on the network as virtual controllers. So we'll just want to reiterate this again. And as I bring out the other point of this hold, you can see what this looks like. So as you can see on the screen here, the inbound leg is the only time in a hold that you're truly using the actual navigation. So let's say that this Navate is a VOR in our example. The only time that you're ever really tracking that VOR radial is right here on the inbound leg. When you subsequently pass the inbound leg, you make this 180 degree turn and you start flying this way on the outbound leg, this is done entirely by reference to a heading that you're going to pick. In a no wind condition, it would just be the opposite of the inbound leg. So again, some people tend to get confused and think, okay, my hold could be potentially flying the opposite. I could just go this way, outbound on the VOR and then turn back around inbound. That's never the way that a holding pattern is done. Anytime that we're talking about a hold, the inbound leg will always have the leg with navigation. The outbound leg is going to be referenced based on a heading. Yeah, exactly. On the outbound leg, you're always flying away from the fix. You're not using navigation. You're using uh, a reference heading. Um, so dead reckoning, dead reckoning here. We'll talk about all that in a bit. Holding pattern specifications. Turn direction, this one's pretty easy. Standard turns are to the right. So unless you're otherwise told by air traffic control, you are going to be flying a hold with right turns. Um, air traffic control may assign left turns by saying left turns as part of your holding clearance, but normally to the right. Inbound leg time. So you're aiming for the inbound leg. Remember, that's when you're flying to the hold using navigation. That leg from wings level to wings level Below 14,000 should be one minute, above 14,000, one and a half minutes. And then the speed limits, uh, same deal for the inbound leg, or actually for the whole hold, excuse me. Below 6,000, you're at 200 knots or, or lower. 6,000 or 14,000, 230 knots is your limit. Above 14,000 can't get uh, much better than 265. And we talked about this live in the ground school, but of course, if you're flying a smaller airplane, you know, a Cessna 172 or even a Baron, you'd be pretty hard pressed to beat these speed restrictions. And as I said at the beginning of today's session, those speed restrictions from our perspective as air traffic controllers really don't mean a whole lot. I think they're predominantly there just to keep you from going way too far away from the hold. I mean, imagine if you're doing the hold at 350 knots, how much challenge you'd have trying to even just fly that full racetrack pattern. You'd be taking up a lot of airspace. So I think that's predominantly what those are based around. And again, we're not able to see your airspeed as virtual air traffic controllers, or in most cases in the US, as real controllers either. And so we're not terribly focused on this we're more concerned about the fact that you're flying things correctly. That being said, one thing I will mention about speeds that is a common tactic in the airline world and makes sense for general aviation pilots too. If you are assigned a hold, say because of traffic density, the last thing that you wanna be doing is going quickly into that hold because you're just gonna be sitting there anyway. So one of the things that is pretty standard that you'll hear in the airline world when a holding clearance gets assigned is the pilots will just say, hey, can we have speed our discretion? One thing that does is it means you can slow down as much as you want. So maybe by the time that you actually reach the holding fix, the traffic is cleared up and you can just keep on going. The second thing is it means you don't have to remember these numbers and they are kind of confusing given that there's three of them and you have to remember, well, okay, I was cleared for hold at 6,000. So is it 200 or is it 230? If you just ask for your discretion on the speed and as I say, 95% of the time, ATC doesn't care anyway, you don't have to remember about worrying it, you don't have to worry about remembering it, I should say. And additionally, you have the benefit of not speeding up and wasting that gas just to sit and do racetrack patterns anyway. And remember, we will talk about this at the end of the video, but uh, from an aerodynamic standpoint, the slower you fly, the less fuel you burn. And since you're not really going anywhere in a hold, why would you burn more fuel? But we'll talk about that at the end of the video. All righty, we're getting to the meat of the stuff now, holding clearances you're always going to be referenced the fix. Remember, that's the navigate that you're holding about, the cardinal direction. So with reference to that navigate, where are you holding? The radial or course off of that navigate or to that navigate, navigate that you're holding on. If it's non-standard left turns, a turn direction. If it's non-standard, an inbound leg length, possibly in miles. Uh, but you're always going to get an EFC or an expect further clearance time. 
So let's talk about an example. Cessna 5 Golf Romeo cleared to Putnam. Hold northwest on the 330 radial. Expect further clearance, 1452 Zulu. Let's actually build a holding pattern now. Same clearance, Cessna 5 Golf Romeo clear to Putnam, hold northwest on the 330 radial, expect further clearance, 1452 Zulu. We know that our nav aid or the holding fix is the Putnam VOR. The cardinal direction, which in this case is the northwest, defines where the hold is in relation to that fix. The specified radial defines the course to the tra to track on the inbound leg. So in this case, if you're on the 330 radial to the northwest, your inbound leg, since it has to be towards Putnam, is a 150 track. And because the air traffic control didn't specify anything about turns, we can assume that to be standard, which means it's going to be right turns. So let's just talk about a couple of underlying concepts here that allow us to make this holding pattern visualized as it is on the screen here for you. The first key concept is a radial. So VORs are the only navigation aid where we talk about radials, but VORs are most commonly holding fixes that you're going to get, particularly if you're in the on-route environment, a VOR hold is pretty common. And when we're practicing, it's also sort of the most common thing you see. Nowadays, we're doing a lot of GPS holding, of course, and obviously we know that the GPS or FMS you might be using has the capability to hold over a VOR as well. But VORs have some uniqueness to them because of this concept of the radial. All a radial is is just a line drawn from the center of the VOR outward on whatever heading you've chosen. So in the case of the 330 radial, as you can see on the screen, they've just taken a little dot right in the middle of the button VOR, drawn a line on the 330 heading, and that's what the 330 radial is. The northwest component of the clearance tells you that that's the protected side of the hold. So if I'm northwest of the VOR, I'm in that area where ATC is providing protection. ATC may not necessarily be protecting other areas of the hold. So if you happen to go on the wrong side, there is a potential that you could be in a conflict with traffic or more likely, because we're not going to probably put a guy right beside you in the hold, more likely it's that there may be a terrain conflict there. So if you're on the protected side and you're at the cleared altitude, you know that that airspace has been blocked off for you and nobody else can be there. Not doing an entry, not doing a holding pattern, not flying by. That airspace is specifically protected for you. When you're on the northwest side, on the 330 radial, of course we talked before that we're not holding outbound. So we're not flying a 330 heading, we're always holding inbound to the VOR. And for that reason, the opposite of heading a 330 is 150. That's how we get our inbound track. So in this particular hold, we would start at the Putnam VOR, turn right, fly outbound on a 330 heading for one minute, turn right again, join the radial 330 inbound on a 150 heading, fly that for one minute, now we're back at the Putnam VOR. And we're going to continue like that until we're given further clearance by ATC. Cool. Cool. Thanks for the addition. Alrighty, now we're going to talk about uh, some more intersection or DME hold. Um, basically the same thing as the previous one. Holding accomplished either using a VOR radial and either, either using a cross radial to identify it or a DME to identify it. Same uh, clearance phraseology. And so in this case, the real difference, you know, the phraseology is the same. Procedurally, it's the same. You're still on a radial. You still got to deal with inverting your course, most likely, um, if you're going to be inbound to the fix. But the situation is that the fix is not just the VOR itself. In this case, it's a cross radial. And again, depending on how that cross radial is set up, you could actually be holding outbound on the VOR, as is shown here, or you could be holding inbound on the VOR. That's what's a little bit different about this. But again, the actual phraseology is the same. The point of this slide is just identifying there is another version of a VOR hold that might be based on an intersection or a DME. You won't see this one too commonly. Now, GPS holds, these are arguably the most uh, common kind nowadays, uh, or NDB, I guess, same same procedure. Uh, holding is accomplished at an RNAV fix or non-directional beacon. Clearance is based on an inbound track to that station now. So that's the only difference here. Instead of giving a radial off of the VOR you're holding on and having to figure out what your inbound track is, you just have to, uh, you're given the inbound track as part of the clearance. ATC does that work for you this time, it's nice. Cessna 5 Golf Romeo, clear to fix. Hold it southwest on the 060 inbound track. Expect further clearance 1452 Zulu. 
So here everything is effectively laid out for you in a little bit of an easier way. You're told that you're going to hold on the 060 or inbound track. There's no need to worry about inverting the course. There's no need to worry about radials. It's just, OK, I'm going to fly 060 inbound to my GPS waypoint or inbound to the DME, if that's what I'm, or sorry, the NDB, rather, if that's what I'm using. Once I get there, make my right turn, fly outbound for a minute on the opposite heading, right turn again, and then track the 060 inbound to the particular holding location. And as Alex says, with the advent of RNAV and GPS technology, which we'll be covering in a ground school toward the middle of September 2020, there are more and more of these GPS holds that we're seeing, and even the ability to use the GPS to do a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. All right, here's how we actually fly the hold. First of all, you perform the appropriate entry. All entries end with the aircraft crossing the fix on the inbound leg. So you have to figure out a way to get yourself from whatever you're, is you're flying into the hold. As soon as you cross the fix, your first time, you turn outbound in the appropriate direction for a VOR hold, um, and then you begin timing the outbound leg, a beam the fix. So you start the timer to figure out how long you're flying your outbound leg as soon as you're a beam the fix. For a VOR hold, <clears throat> That's when your two from flag reverses indication. GPS hold is when the GPS course reverses. And a DME hold is when the DME indicates the same DME as the holding fix. Now, as soon as you reach the predetermined outbound time, turn towards the inbound course, start the timer upon completion of the turn when your wings are level. Then you track the inbound course to the fix and note the time crossing the fix. Note how long it took you then turn outbound and repeat. Always make standard rate turns. So what's a standard rate turn? As a reminder, that degrees per second. What's the implication of that? This is a standard turn coordinator. Your wing should be on one of the lower white notches. If you're in one of those turns with the ball perfectly centered, that is a standard rate turn. Implication being three degrees per second, meaning 180 degrees in one minute. So it should take you exactly one minute to go from the inbound leg to the outbound leg one minute on the outbound leg, one minute from the outbound to the inbound leg, and one minute on the inbound leg. All were, uh, all in total, uh, a one lap in the hold should take you four minutes if you're flying all your turns at standard rate. So taking a bit of a pause to just evaluate what we've talked about here, we're covering entries in the next few minutes. They get a little bit complicated. But the idea with respect to any hold is you've got to get to the fix first, then you've got to do your entry, once you've finished your entry, you'll effectively be at the point where you're over the fix, ready to start your outbound turn. As Alex says, using a standard rate turn, you'll make a turn 180 degrees. That'll take you one minute. Fly your outbound ending for one minute. Another 180 degree turns for the third minute. And in theory, the last minute should be you tracking the inbound course. If only there was no wind, it would be that easy. And yet there is wind and we have to correct for it. Wind can have two effects on your holding pattern. A headwind or a tailwind will cause your inbound leg timing to be incorrect. And remember, we always uh, fix our inbound leg and adjust our outbound accordingly. A crosswind will cause you to undershoot or overshoot the inbound course on your inbound turn. Let's talk about how to fix those. When you're flying a holding pattern, there are two ways you can correct the wind. You can adjust the outbound heading to roll out on the inbound turn or the, on the inbound course or you can adjust the outbound time, rather I should say, and you can adjust the inbound outbound time to create a one minute inbound leg. To fix the heading, we double the crab angle maintained on the inbound leg. So for an example, if you're flying your inbound leg and you're staying on track and you know that you need to uh, crab seven degrees to the right to stay on track, on the outbound leg, you know you double and reverse that. So if you're crabbing seven degrees to the right on the inbound leg, you're crabbing 14 degrees to the left on the outbound leg. And of course, we'll remember that the inbound leg is the leg with navigational guidance. So let's use a VOR because it's a little bit easier to understand. If we're tracking the VOR radial using that same example that we had from the previous slide, the Putnam 330 radial, if we're tracking that perfectly in a no wind condition, our heading would be 150 inbound to the VOR. However, if it turns out that to track that radial, 
we actually need a crab of seven degrees right. So instead of flying a 150 heading, we're actually flying a 157 heading in order to maintain that 150 track on the radial. Then we know that seven degrees right was required on the inbound. Now we can apply this rule and say, okay, if I need to go seven degrees right on my inbound to maintain the navigation on this radial, I'll just double and reverse that. So now when I'm outbound, instead of flying a 330 heading, which would be the standard in no wind, I would just go 14 degrees left of that 330 heading. And in theory, that correction of 14 degrees will help to deal with the fact that I'm getting blown by the wind, not just on the inbound and the outbound legs, but also on those two minute long turns that we're making to get ourselves turned around. We'll go through an example that clarifies this in a few minutes. Now we talked about heading, let's talk about timing. This is the more nuanced one. You adjust the timing by lengthening or shortening the outbound leg by two thirds to achieve an inbound leg timing of one minute. For example, if the inbound leg takes 40 seconds, you need an additional 20 to get to that minute. So you have 40, your inbound leg took 40 seconds, so you need an extra 20. Two thirds of 20 is 13. So you add 13 seconds to the outbound leg Therefore, the outbound leg should take 73 seconds to get the in second inbound leg or subsequent ones to be one minute. Note that these corrections are less effective when there's a tailwind on the inbound leg. If that's the case, you really just have to do trial and error and figure out what works. Uh, one second per knot of wind is a good baseline, um, but at that point, just do trial and error, and hopefully you're not going to be in the hold long enough to actually figure out uh, exactly what it takes you. I will say from my experience in flying that these corrections are pretty good most of the time. Nothing is ever perfect. We know that the wind can change and you can get gusts and things like that. But as a general rule of thumb, both of these two corrections will actually do a very good job of keeping you on an inbound leg of one minute and allowing for your turns to be such that you can hopefully join up with that inbound leg nicely. So you may have to adjust a little bit as you go. If you're seven degrees doubling, it doesn't quite work out. You might decide to go a little bit more, or a little bit less on your next pass. But as Alex says, through trial and error, you'll find your way to the appropriate timing. And of course, we always hope that unless we're holding for the practice, we always hope that that hold is so short that it doesn't really end up mattering anyway. So with that, those rules covered, we're going to now go through an example where we have you figure out the appropriate headings based on a sample holding clearance that we're going to give. The advantage to you watching this recording is that you can do this at your own pace. So Alec is going to ask a question, and after the question, he'll pause for about a second or two. And in that time, we would encourage you to hit the pause button on the video take a moment to really think about the question, come up with the answer, maybe even write it down, and then press play again, and we'll give you the answer and explain why. This session is best run interactively, so we really encourage you to take the opportunity since you're watching this in the recorded version. When we ask a question, pause before we give the answer, come up with the answer that you think is correct based on what you've heard so far, and then we'll see how you did. So here's your holding clearance. Clear to Boston. Hold north on the 360 radial. Expect further clearance, 1600 Zulu. There's your diagram. Um, Boston's your nav aid. You're holding north on it. There's the, uh, you were not specified a heading. Therefore, right turns. What is the uncorrected outbound heading? Reminder to so pause the video. Okay, you should have gotten hopefully 360 as the uncorrected heading. What is the uncorrected inbound heading? 180, and you can see that on the diagram. If you're, if you're uh, tracking the 360 radial, but you're on the north side of the VOR and you're going to it, you should be on a 180 heading. What outbound heading should you fly if 185 is required to maintain the inbound track? And remember, you'll determine that by adjusting the heading that you need in order to maintain the inbound track by two. So in the situation we've described previously in the last slide, we talked about adjusting the heading by doubling the correction that you need to maintain on the inbound leg and reversing it. Pause the video and see what you come up with. 
Hopefully you got three, five, zero. Remember if you're adding five knots to the right on the inbound, subtract 10 knots to the left on the outbound. It should be a three, five, zero heading. Alex said knots there, but we mean degrees. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, degrees. Now, what time it should be maintained should be maintained on the outbound leg if the inbound leg takes 51 seconds instead of the desired 60 seconds. And remember, you adjust the timing by taking two thirds of the difference. 66 seconds. Let's talk about how we got that. So we know the inbound leg should be 60 seconds. It actually took us 51. There's a nine second difference. So we know that we're undershooting it by nine seconds. Two thirds of that is six. So we add six seconds to our outbound time. So hopefully, hoping to get our inbound time to one minute or even. Hopefully you got all four of those questions, but if you didn't, I'll just cover a quick review of those points and then we'll go through another example to solidify things. The uncorrected outbound heading in this case comes directly off of the VOR. We were cleared to hold north on the 360 radial. Therefore, the heading that we would fly as we're on the outbound leg here on this side, which is the left side of the diagram, that's going to be a 360 heading. Once we make our 180 degree turn, we're going to be tracking this 360 radial. If we were going this way, it would be a 360 heading, but we're tracking that inbound to the station, heading to the south on a 180 heading. For the next question, we talk about the outbound heading that should be flown if heading 185 is required. Have a look at where the wind is coming from, which is shown in this diagram. If a heading of 185 is required, that basically means my airplane is pointing just slightly toward the bottom left of the slide. In other words, I'm crabbing into the wind. Once I make that outbound turn, I want to continue crabbing into the wind, and I want to double that correction but reverse it. So instead of five degrees right, I'm going to go 10 degrees to the left, if my uncorrected outbound heading was 360, now I want to be on heading 350. That's going to point my airplane into the wind or toward the top left of the slide, and that's going to help me maintain the track that I want of 360. And as Alec just said, the timing is adjusted on the outbound leg. So we've always wanted to maintain a one-minute leg inbound on the 360 radial. In order to make sure that that leg inbound is one minute, we adjust the timing of the outbound leg to either go further or closer to the VOR on the basis of how long I need. Because we can see that the wind is such that there is a very, very slight tailwind on the inbound track, I'm going to need to extend that outbound track a little bit so that I'm into the headwind and then the tailwind pushes me closer to the VOR. That'll all make it work out for one minute. So with that being the case, the inbound leg takes 51 seconds. That gives us 66 seconds on the outbound. We fly that into the headwind for a little bit longer when we're going slower. Then as we make the turn and go in toward the VOR going faster, we'll be hopefully aiming for that one minute to make up for the extra six seconds we've added to the outbound leg. Good point, Tevin. Hopefully all that is clear. And if not, just go back and rewatch. Example number two. Holding clearance clear to Putnam. Hold northwest on the 330 radial. Expect further clearance 1452 Zulu. That should be a pretty familiar sound of clearance by now. What is the uncorrected outbound heading? Remember, no, uh, just like in real life, no diagram given to you this time. What is the uncorrected outbound heading? And hopefully you should have gotten 330. What is the uncorrected inbound heading? Hopefully you got 150. Here's your diagram now. Same deal as the previous time. Outbound is uh, the same as the radial or tracking. Inbound is the reciprocal. Now, what outbound heading should you fly if your if a heading of 140 is required to maintain the inbound track? Hopefully you got 350. Remember, we need uh, 10 degrees to the left on the inbound, then we need 20 degrees to the right on the outbound, 350 degrees. And what timing should be maintained on the outbound leg if the inbound leg actually takes 90 seconds instead of the desired 60? 40 seconds is the answer here. Remember, two thir the 30 second difference, two thirds of that is 20. Subtract 20 from 60 to get 40 seconds on the outbound. And from where is the wind blowing? Just qualitatively, quantitative, qualitatively speaking. Ideally, you got the wind blowing from somewhere from the east, in this case, the northeast. And of course, we know that because we can look at what heading were we required to maintain the inbound track. Here, we were supposed to be on an inbound track of 150. 
it took us actually heading 140 to do that. That means we're crabbing the aircraft to the left, so toward the bottom right of the slide. And if we're crabbing toward the bottom left, we're crabbing into the wind to obviously counteract its effects. That's how we know the wind is coming from the northeast. Now the hold entry. Now that we've covered the hold, let's discuss the actual entry. These are relevant not just to holding procedures, but to instrument approach procedures. You might have a hold in lieu of a procedure turn, and I invite you to uh, come view our ground school in the next coming weeks for more detail on those. Three types of hold entries, direct, parallel, and teardrop or offset. Offset is more uh, common in IKEA world. In the United States, you almost exclusively use teardrop. Same deal. They mean the same thing. We're going to talk about each of these three holding entry procedures in detail in just a moment. But one important concept to point out here is that these are only recommendations. There's nothing regulatory that says you must fly a direct entry when coming from one side or the other. However, the direct entry in some cases is a more efficient and a more easier entry than a teardrop entry might be. In other scenarios, if you're on the opposite side, a parallel or teardrop entry might make a lot more sense than a direct entry, which would end up creating a whole bunch of confusion. The most important thing for us in virtual controllers, those virtual controllers and us virtual pilots, again, is really just you stay on the correct side of the hold on the protected side, which in this case is toward the north of the holding fix that's depicted socio, and also do you stay at the altitude that we've cleared you to be at? If you decide that you do a parallel entry when in fact a teardrop is recommended, the entry might not look all that well organized, but from an air traffic control perspective, it's probably not going to make much of a difference. If you're about to do your instrument check right tomorrow, certainly your examiner is going to want to see an entry that matches the FAA's recommendations. But from a virtual flying perspective, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about hold entries. If you really want to be precise with your learning and your knowledge, following the correct entry and using the methodology that we're about to explain will certainly give you that little bit of edge. But from a practical day-to-day -day perspective, if you're cleared for a hold and you do a parallel entry instead of a direct, that's probably not going to make much of a difference if you stay at the correct altitude and if you stay within the protected side of the hold. And in this particular example, the protected side is basically the airspace where the hold is to the north of the socio intersection and slightly to the east southeast of the intersection as well good point evan yeah again these are all recommendations but some of them will make your life easier <clears throat> and the key with these entries is where you're coming from so when we start to look at the direct entry is skipping ahead here a little bit when we start looking at direct entry if you're on the side of the hole where the direct entry is so in this case on the right side that's where you'd be making that entry from if you happen to be up here where the parallel sector is you'd be doing a parallel and a teardrop from down here. We're going to talk about all that in the next couple slides. Now, there are a couple of reporting points. So unless otherwise instructed, you have to report the time and altitude the first time you cross the holding fix as part of the entry and when you're leaving any assigned holding fix or point. Usually, though, in practice, air traffic control will tell you just to uh, report established inbound, meaning you don't have to do either of those two. Yeah, I wonder how often people actually make those reports. Uh, to be honest, almost never. Yeah, just like the reporting top of descent, like I hear that about four times a year. Yeah, it's it's really not that common. Uh, you're supposed to do it, but in practice, it's not that common. Although I, I will point out that I do it, and every time I hear somebody else do it, I'm like, yes, it's not just me. <laughs> Alrighty, direct entry this is the easy one. For direct entry, you cross the fix and begin the normal outbound turn. And so you can see from the slide here, if you're anywhere those two airplanes are, the direct entry makes the most sense. You're simply flying directly to the holding fix of Socio, and you're already pointing in the correct direction. You're effectively already in the hold. You just make your next 180 degree right turn to the outbound heading, and you're on the way to conducting the hold just like you would any other situation. Direct entry is nice and easy if you happen to be coming from the side that the hold is actually on. Parallel entry, this one's a little trickier. For a parallel entry, you're basically coming from the opposite side, so you have to reverse your uh, course completely. For a parallel entry, cross the fix and turn outbound to parallel the inbound course. So this is the only time where you're tracking the inbound course, but in the other direction. So for a parallel entry, cross the fix and turn outbound to parallel the inbound course. 
After a minute of doing so, turn 225 to 240 degrees towards the hold and intercept the inbound course. Again, after one minute, you'd make a turn on the protected side, that's key. You turn towards the protected side of the hold and intercept the inbound course. So as you can see the diagram, and as Alex says, when we're up on this particular sector, it wouldn't make sense to try and do a direct entry because you'd have to somehow be able to hit the holding fix, make a magical turn back in this direction, and then somehow enter the hold, right? That's why these other types of entry have been established, to help you figure out how to effectively turn yourself around and in an organized way get you back into the hold. So once we do the parallel entry, we're going to hit the fix, which in this case is socio. We're going to parallel but going the opposite direction of the hold. And then as Alex says, it's really important here that we're making, a, in this example, a left turn. So we're going to go toward the protected side, toward where the holding is, make this big left turn, and then it's permissible to either go directly to the fix or most people will actually turn, intercept the inbound, and then track it in just like my mouse is doing here. It's important to note again, as Alex says, that once you're paralleling the course, making a turn to the south or making a right turn back would be incorrect. That would take you into unprotected airspace, and that's a problem if you are dealing with air traffic control, if you're dealing with traffic, if you're dealing with some terrain on the other side of the area. You want to make sure that you're always staying in the airspace that's been specifically designated for your holding, and in this case, that involves a left turn. Now, again, if we were looking at the opposite scenario, if we were looking at a hold that was with other direction of turns with left turns instead of right. Now we're going to also flip the direction we turn here. Again, as Alex said, we're staying on the protected side while we're doing our entry, and then we're going to enter the hold and continue to remain on that protected side. And now we're going to talk about the teardrop entries. For a teardrop entry, uh, you're coming in from the side that's uh, diagonally opposite the protected side. You cross the fix, you turn to a heading 30 degrees from the outbound course on the holding side. After one minute, you turn towards the inbound course to intercept and track it inbound. And so again, here we're finding ourselves in the bottom left of this picture. There's no easy way for us to fly a direct entry from here. So an organized means of getting ourselves turned around and establishing the hold is the teardrop entry that you've actually seen on this slide. But of course, the question is, how do you figure this out in practice? Because it's not easy to see yourself on a nice overlaid top-down map with quadrants segmented out for you to decide which way you need to go. And for that reason, we are presenting you with one of several ways to determine what the most appropriate or what the recommended hold entry is on the basis of something you have right in front of you in the airplane, which is your heading indicator. And let's talk about how to do those. Clear to Putnam. Hold northwest on the 330 radial, right turns. Expect further clearance, 1452 Zulu. Remember that here, right turns is a standard turn, so there was really no reason for air traffic control to give you that. Uh, but here, it's just a little reminder. Start with your recommended hold entry. So start with your current heading. In this case, it's north. Identify the outbound track you wish to fly. In this case, 330. And again, that's just the Putnam VOR 330 radial. That's the radial that we were cleared to fly on. So our inbound track on that radial is 150, but we're asked here to find the outbound track. The outbound track is 330, same as the radial. Exactly. Then you segment your heading indicator. So you do a vertical and a horizontal line. And then you turn the horizontal segment 20 degrees in opposite direction of the direction of the turns in the hold. What does that mean? That means if you're holding here and it's standard hold, right turns, you turn your horizontal segment 20 degrees to the left. Just like so. And there are your new diagrams. So, I'm sorry, your new sectors. So you figure out which of the segments your outbound turn fits into. In this case, the middle one, it's going to be parallel. So the recommended entry for this hold is a parallel. And if that didn't make sense, don't worry. We have plenty more examples to show you. Let's talk about segmenting the heading indicator. Again, for standard right turns, uh, we rotate the bar 20 degrees to the left, break it up into the three sectors. The smallest one's the teardrop, the middle one's the parallel, the big one's the direct. For non-standard right turns, we left rotate... Turns. I'm sorry, non-standard left turns, correct. S sorry, Evan. Uh, you turn the horizontal bar 20 degrees to the right, and again. 
smallest sector is the teardrop, middle one's the parallel, the big one's the direct. So important to note here that because, or I should say when we are dealing with non-standard turns, we're making left turns in the holding pattern instead of right turns, we have to segment the heading indicator differently. The heading indicator gets segmented the opposite way of the turn, and then we also, as you'll see here, have flipped the parallel and the teardrop. So regardless of where they are, I think the easiest way to remember it is the way Alex said it. The direct is always the biggest segment, the parallel is always the middle, and the teardrop is always the smallest. Here on the right turns diagram, we can see that the P and the T are shown with the P on the left, the T on the right. When we go to the left turns diagram on the other side, then everything gets swapped around. But again, the direct is still the biggest segment, the parallel is still the middle, the teardrop is always the smallest. And that's a nice, easy way to remember this. Of course, when you're actually dealing with a heading indicator in the airplane, you don't have these lines there. But if you have a pen, a pencil, anything else that has a straight line, it's nice and easy just to put that right on top of the heading indicator, twist it 20 degrees opposite the direction of the turn, and you'll have to just visualize that line between the teardrop and the parallel. But that'll help you be able to make this very quick determination of what the recommended entry is, regardless of where you are, regardless of how much time you have, all you need is your heading indicator. So as you can see here in the examples where we have a 360 heading, the airplane is pointing north. If we are dealing with standard right turns, an outbound track of 320, so say we're cleared to hold in the 320 radial, that would be a parallel entry. In the exact same holding clearance, but with left turns instead, notice how the 320 segment falls instead as a teardrop entry. So it will depend on the direction of turn. The clearance could be the exact same, hold northwest on the 320 radial, the only difference is if you're told left turns versus right turns, that can totally define which of the two entries you might be doing. Once again, for a right turn hold, if you've given a clearance for the 120 radial, you can see that falls within the direct segment, so that's going to be a direct entry. For left turns, if I was cleared to hold on a 060 radial, my outbound track happens to fall in the parallel entry. So the key is just using your heading indicator, putting that little segment there, twisting it 20 degrees opposite direction of the turn, and then figuring out where that outbound track would fall based on the way you've just segmented your heading indicator. All very good points, Evan. Now, now this is a new slide we've created just for you guys in the recording, and we thought it would be easier. We're about to go through, I don't know if it's six or seven, but plenty of examples, plenty of brain-teasing examples on how to do holds. And so if you weren't melting down before this, you're about to now. To make this just a little bit easier for you, we've come up with a couple of things that you can save on your computer as you're watching along to be able to make the determination of the entry a little bit easier. If you're following along on your computer and you have a flash enabled browser, you can click on this link right here. That'll be in the notes of this video as well. That'll take you to this page. Now you will have to enable flash, which is going to be different based on everyone's browsers. And so here in uh, my Firefox browser, there's a way to do that. There's also a way to do that in Chrome as well. Um, once you've downloaded or enabled Flash, I'm going to just switch over to Chrome to be able to do this. Uh, you'll see something that looks a little bit like this. All that we're doing here is just making a heading indicator for ourselves. So this IFR simulator, you can actually just double click on the airplane and whatever you want to use as your current heading, type in here and hit enter. So if I wanted a heading indicator that shows me with heading 200 up at the top, to be able to use for my segmentation, I can do it that way. If I want the heading to be 150 at the top, I can do it that way. Some people find it easier to go through these examples when they actually have a heading indicator in front of them that is referencing the direction of the airplane. If you don't have the ability to do flash or you want just an easier option, what you can do is just take a screenshot of this picture right here, or you can even print this slide out. Uh, if you take a screenshot and then just copy this into Word, whatever's easier for you, Ultimately, what we want to do is grab a screenshot of this or have this in front of us so that you can write the heading up on the top here. You can segment out the heading indicator as we've described, and that'll make going through these next couple of examples that much easier for you. All righty. Let us determine the entry. Your aircraft heading is 200. Your holding radial is the Boston 360. And your standard right turns. So what I'll do just to walk through this first example with you is I'll show you using the IFR simulator just as a reference point for our heading indicator, how we would go about determining the entry. So if my aircraft heading is 200, 
I'll just set that up here. Again, I'm not using this simulator to actually try and fly the hold or anything. All I want is this nice picture of the heading indicator with two zeros are up at the top. Now that I've got that in front of me, I'm going to segment the heading indicator. Now bear with me here as I draw with the pen and my mouse. I'll try my best to draw a straight line. So I've got one line going north-south, and then I would be drawing a horizontal line as well. I'm going to twist that opposite the direction of the turn. So because we are now dealing with a standard turn, I'm going to draw that opposite segmentation kind of like that. Again, just doing this roughly here for us to be able to see. We know that the direct entry area is the biggest, and the teardrop is the smallest, parallel fits in the middle. Now that I've got this segmentation, I need to figure out where that holding radio is going to be because that's my outbound track. So if my outbound track is the holding radio of 360, that's going to be right here on the north, 360. And I can see that that particular outbound track falls very clearly within this direct entry area. Because of that, we know this is going to be a direct entry hold. The slide will actually step us through that. So here's the picture again with two zeros are up at the top. We've done the twisting of the segmentation to be able to give us our three segments. Here's a picture that shows the actual hold itself. We know that 360 falls into the direct segment, and so we have a direct entry. And this is how it would look. So there's your example. We're going to now go through several of these. And just like in the previous part of this presentation where we had you guys go through and do this interactively, we'll present you with the heading, the holding radial, and the turn direction. We'll give you a moment to actually go ahead and come up with the entry. But again, don't try and wait for us to do that real time. As soon as you see the information, pause the video, take as much time as you need, draw out the holding entry, use a picture like this one, use a picture like the one that we had in the previous slide, come up with your heading at the top, come up with the entry that you feel is correct. And once you've got that, unpause the slide and we'll walk you through our answers. Alrighty, so the aircraft heading you're currently on, three, uh, 030. You're holding radials, the Putnam 330 radial, and standard right turns. Okay, hopefully you've managed to divide up your uh, heading indicator. Remember, you draw the 330 outbound heading now. Looks like that's in the parallel sector. So it does look like it's a parallel entry indeed. Hopefully you got that. We're going to get our next example. Your aircraft heading is 200. Holding radial is the Nantucket 240 radial with left non-standard turns. Take a moment, pause the video. Okay, hopefully you got the heading indicator <clears throat> all uh, sectored up. Two zero zeros up top, you turn 20 degrees, the horizontal bar to the right because it's uh, left non-standard turns. Now you draw the 240 outbound. Again, looks like it's in the parallel sector. This will be a parallel entry. And if you were thinking teardrop entry from the work you did, chances are you may have segmented the heading indicator the opposite direction, thinking that was right turns as we've done in the previous examples. But remember when we're dealing with the left turn hold, we have also a different entry to deal with. So here the parallel entry, we're going to come up onto the Nantucket VR, which is our holding nav aid in this case, make a slight right turn, track that VR outbound, and make another right turn toward the protected side, come back around to re-intercept the radial. Now that we're coming back inbound to Nantucket, we're basically established in the hold, and it's just a matter of flying the hold and applying those wind corrections from here on out. All righty, next entry. Aircraft headings 290, 290, holding radial is the Boston 360 radial with standard right turns. Take a moment. Okay, hopefully you did that. Uh, Divide up your heading indicator, turn 20 degrees in the opposite direction to rotate the horizontal line 20 degrees to the left. Draw the outbound course of 360. Okay, looks like that is directly on the line. So what does that mean here? Uh, that means you could either do a teardrop or a direct or some pilots uh, will prefer to do a combination of both. So we've got a bit of a combination direct and teardrop entry shown on the slide here. When we did this live, I commented to Alec that I usually like the direct entry because I'm lazy and I can kind of just cheat and get away with it. And Alec's comment was that he prefers the teardrop entry, which is probably, in all reality, 
a better idea because it's a little bit more organized. In truth, to do a direct entry, if you really wanted to do it the correct way, you'd be coming up on the holding fix like this and basically be wanting to crank it to the left very quickly and then back around to the right. This looks pretty in a picture, doesn't look quite so pretty in the airplane. Whereas your other alternative, if you are dealing with a, instead of doing a direct entry, a teardrop entry would be to simply come out this way and almost similar to what you see in the slide, come out here and then fly your teardrop procedure. So whichever way you choose when you have a uh, holding radial or an outbound track that's within a few degrees of the actual segment line, you have the ability to choose from the recommended teardrop or direct entries. And again, because this is all recommendation, as the pilot, you ultimately get to make the decision. From a virtual air traffic control perspective, flying on that sim, it really won't make a huge amount of difference. But from the perspective of your examiner, they may have a preference and certainly your flight instructor will have some guidance for you. If you are indeed in the middle of instrument training, definitely look to what your flight instructor's guidance is for the situation. And in the case of Alex, that's gonna be a teardrop. Yeah, that's the way that I definitely would teach my students, just uh, from my own perspective, as Evan mentioned. In this case, if you want to do direct, what you're technically supposed to do is turn left and then start an immediate right turn. So in this case, what I would do and what I would teach my students in the real world, just make it a teardrop. But really, whatever works for you, as long as you stay on the protected side. Absolutely. Alrighty, uh, next example here. Your aircraft heading is 330. Now, pay attention, your GPS hold is along the 090 inbound track with non-standard left turns. Remember, we're not given a radial anymore. We're given an inbound track from air traffic control. Take a moment. All right, hopefully you took that, uh, divided up your heading indicator, uh, took the horizontal line, rotated it 20 degrees to the right, and tracked your outbound track. So what is your outbound track now? Remember, if your inbound is 090, your outbound must be 270. There's a line, it's in the teardrop. So a common mistake on this one would be to think, as we were doing in previous examples, VORs, and think, okay, my clearance was on the outbound radial, so now I have to do the inversion. Actually, we're dealing with an inversion in this case because we're given a hold clearance with the inbound track. So it's important to note when you're, again, given a GPS hold or an NDB hold, as we had talked about in the beginning of this presentation, if the clearance was for the inbound track and we're looking for the outbound track on our little method here for determining the entry, we'll have to flip that around. On previous examples, when we've been doing VOR holds, our clearance had the outbound radial already included, so there was no need to worry about doing that flip. All righty, determine the entry. Your aircraft heading is 270. Your NDB hold is along the 040 inbound track with standard right turns. All right, take the heading indicator, take the horizontal line, rotate it 20 degrees to the left, draw the uh, outbound track. If your inbound is 040, your outbound is 220. That's in the parallel sector, parallel entry. And last example, aircraft heading is 170. Holding radial is the Putnam 330 radial <clears throat> with non-standard left turns. Take a moment. All right, hopefully you did that. Uh, take the heading indicator, non-standard right turns, so you have uh, non-standard left turns. Take the horizontal line and rotate it 20 degrees to the right. And if uh, your holding radial is 330, that means your outbound course is 330. Draw it. And that's in the direct sector, which if you look at the diagram, works out pretty well here. So again, we've gone back now to VOR holds just to make sure we haven't forgotten that since we've been talking GPS and NDV clearances momentarily. So now that we've been doing, now that we're back to the VOR land, they give us the Putnam 330 radial. That is our outbound track. We can put that directly onto the heading indicator. All right, fuel usage. Most holds are short term, so less than 15 minutes. They're really quick. Fuel is normally not an issue. With that said, if you're holding for an extended period of time, like a runway closure or some sort of emergency that had to close down the airport or you need to figure something out, consider reducing power to conserve fuel. The maximum endurance airspeed is the most efficient configuration for holding or really for any extended period of flight. And if it's not published, 
you can estimate max endurance for a propeller driven aircraft like a reciprocating engine or a turboprop that's about three quarters of your best glide speed for a turbojet aircraft it is your best glide speed how do you practice holds first you can fly the quote-unquote full procedure instrument approaches that required holds in lieu of procedure turns so instead of uh getting cleared straight in uh you can uh, just do a lap or two in the hold or you can even request to go in this case direct to the initial approach fix and actually fly the entry of the hold we yeah, talked okay. about this at the beginning of today's session that holds aren't just for i need to sit at this waypoint for a few minutes to build some time up holds can also be because we're coming in from the northwest say uh, maybe over this particular um this particular obstacle we're coming in from this direction of course, we could just ask for vectors from ATC, but we could also head direct to Mujic. And now that we're at Mujic, well, we can't really make a left turn and go this way. That'd be a pretty sharp turn to be able to join the ILS. So just like we do with the hold, we would probably want to fly a teardrop entry, come out this way, and then in a nice organized way, intercept the ILS back here at a nice safe altitude where we can fly the approach correctly. That's a great example of how the stuff we've just covered as far as hold entries can be applied in your real world IFR flying. If you're deciding to not request vectors from ATC or even in a scenario where vectors aren't available, which happens at a lot of higher elevation airports and a lot of places where there may not be great radar coverage for you to be able to get a vector to final or the terrain may not allow for it. Very good point. You could also request to fly the full MIST approach procedure and hold as published. Most, uh, if not all, MIST approaches have a MIST approach procedure uh, that hold includes a hold. You could request a hold from air traffic control. That's probably would be a first one as a virtual controller. I've never heard someone request a hold before, but uh, I guess it could happen. I've had a couple. Usually it happens right after this ground school, honestly. Oh, cool. And... Uh, our personal favorite, participate in Wings Over New England, which is BVA's new pilot training program. You get to learn all this and more from the same excellent instructors in an organized fashion. Highly recommend you check that out. Thank you very much for uh, watching this special edition of the BVA Ground School of Hold Entries. Uh, most of the ground school is now complete. I invite you to check out our further ground schools, which are next Monday uh, and throughout the rest of the Mondays in September 2020. Two weeks will be devoted to approach plates. And then lastly, R and F departures, arrivals, and approaches. You can find the full schedule for ground school as well as information on how to participate on the Boston Virtual Air TCC website as well as on the forums for VAT USA and VATSIM. All members of VATSIM are more than welcome to attend the remaining three sessions that we have. And of course, we're publishing all of our videos right here on YouTube alongside this one. If you want to see the live presentation of this seminar that was held back on August 24th, featuring a big mistake on one of the slides that finally somebody caught after, I think, about seven years worth of giving this presentation, we invite you to do that. The link for that is also in the show notes. If you're looking for more information on holds, that will help you find maybe just a little bit more detail. You'll have the ability to go through this at a live pace, watching some of the other answers from the people who actually did this live and also benefiting from their questions. And as Alex said, if you have any additional questions, feel free to find him or me, post on the VATSIM, VATUSA, or BVA forums, find us on Discord, or ask a flight instructor. And thank you very much for taking the time to participate. We hope you've enjoyed this session. Hope you take part in some of our other ground schools coming up over the next few weeks. And if not, that you catch us on video. Thanks very much for being part of the virtual aviation community, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.